male child subconsciously wishes to sleep with his mother. Of course, what puzzles me, Harold, is that you want to sleep with your grandmother. Right? We've been there, guys. Is that a zing? Yeah, it's it's a major zing. Uh, Yeah, I I think everybody's been there once or twice. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Uh, this This is the introduction of the manic pixie dream granny, right? Well, what's funny about that is I I didn't I don't know I know nothing about this film absolutely nothing it's all I know is you, like the okay. reputation right, right. Uh, and the first thing I thought of as I was watching this was this manic pixie dream girl like this is like at yeah, least the template totally. for it right absolutely so I think that uh, that will spark some interesting discussions it's going to be tough to have Harold and Maude as our chaser film but uh we will come back to it after we discuss our main feature but first intro the show dan what are we listening to this is film trace the podcast where we trace the life of a film from conception to production all the way to release and reception we also have a returning special guest uh gary from cinema shock introduce yourself gary how are you doing hey i'm gary and i am great it's good to be back guys i am honored to be here uh, what have you? I was listening to your guys, uh, the Cameron series, and I was listening to the yes, T two episode. It was awesome, really good stuff. Oh, well, thanks, man. Yeah, I, I was uh, telling uh, Chris, I was like, hey, I, I get it. Uh, Cinema Shock is it's a lot. It's uh, we we've gone through multiple iterations of the show, but we're finally on one where we're like, you know what? One of the most popular podcasts out there was Hardcore History. Let's try to do something like that for movies. Yeah, and so, absolutely. like, we we dig in on a director and we just try to tell their whole freaking story. <laughs> and so, it's going to work yeah. for some people, but some people, I think, it's going to turn off. But you know, it is what it is. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, the deep, but like the deep deep dive stuff. And I was telling you, Gary, I'll say it on the mic now, but like to devote that entire episode to James Cameron's <laughs> losing his mind uh, and being missing from the industry for so long uh, was just as fascinating as like a deep dive on an actual specific title. So um, if you haven't listened to Cinema Shock, it's, it's definitely right up um, the alley of, I think, a lot of uh, Film Trace listeners. So check them out. And you guys are moving on to horror now. You did a Pumpkinhead episode. Now you're starting a Sam Raimi series. Yeah, every one, once in a while, just for fun, we do a roulette episode in between series that we do. And so Pumpkinhead came up on the roulette. We have like a list of, I think there's like 500 movies on that list. Love it. And so we just uh, hit a random thing and it picks a movie and we talk about that one. It's all like movies we think there's not much of a deep dive we can get into as far as a director. Um, I mean, the director of that one is... Uh, I don't know why his name just slipped my mind, but the uh, makeup artist guy, he's great. <laughs> I just forgot his name. Um, <laughs> now, right I, now I feel really guilty, so I'm going to look it up really quick. Now while I'm talking to you. Now you're going to listen to the episode. <laughs> I know, now I'm like, what What am I thinking? Why Why did I not yeah, get Stan who Winston. the director was? <laughs> it's Stan Winston. Oh, Good there God. You go, there you go. And he did a bunch of Cameron stuff, so it actually works, I think. You it was really weird. Yeah. It's really weird this whole, this whole time since we started the show this way, how things move uh, how how much interaction or you know just like weaving in and out these people do with each other and so like even right now we're doing uh sam raimi and uh so we just started that series with evil dead but uh you 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 start digging into sam raimi and there's crossover he's he crosses over a lot with the cohen brothers oh yeah and uh it's just uh i don't know it's it's interesting once you start digging in on their history just like how many of these people know each other like on the pumpkin head screenings you know james cameron was there so it was kind of cool like we're getting to hear like <laughs> he that, was... that reminds me there's a, a fun story that i read on twitter recently that connects cameron and raimi where james cameron uh excitedly like grabbed bill paxton and said have you seen evil dead 2 yet and he said no so then he like shoved him in his car and took him out to the middle of nowhere one screen cinema house to to watch it and be like this is this guy's the future of cinema so. <laughs> yeah i somebody literally just sent me that and oh, yeah. uh, so and that's cool. pretty that's pretty interesting and we, like right before that we'd done like dan o'bannon and, and i talked about great, aliens yeah. and stuff yeah and then uh he was he was you know uh obviously he worked with james cameron on aliens and then uh he was there at the pumpkin head screenings and stuff and like just they were talking about how he'd sit in the front row of pumpkin head and be like oh shit this is awesome <laughs> <laughs> small little world well kind of like you guys dive we do deep dives into themes 
uh, instead of directors. And this one is our second episode of risque romance. Chris, how do you feel about the term risque? Uh, as I kind of touched on in our inaugural episode about uh, Lolita and uh, <laughs> Taste of Honey, that was a tough one. Um, that's a tough one. It was a, that was a really difficult. Like I would, that's another comment I was going to make to kind of lead us into discussing both Badlands and Harold and Maude. This is the first film trace episode in a very long time where I love both films. Like have very little criticisms to to, to espouse about either of them and. Uh, so it's interesting that this is such a like discomforting topic, uh, and yet you have movies that is just like I never want to think about it again, yeah. like Lolita, despite being you know by one of the most respected auteurs of all time. But then also like these movies such as Badlands, where it's like it's Terry Malick doing his thing in his debut feature, and it's everything that any film nerd has that has ever appreciated Malick could could want um without any of his like more um pretentious and uh idiosyncratic things that he winds up kind of indulging in a lot more later in his career right um so the risk a part is definitely still there but it's oh, absolutely. I, I feel like it's going to be it's going to temper it's going to be tempered by my just like straight up adoration for these two films so what do you think dan where are you at with it Oh, with Badlands? I mean, like, oh, this... Okay, so Badlands is um, a movie I saw probably 20 years ago. Um, yeah, I, I worship Terrence Malick and have ever since I saw a Thin Red Line opening night in... Uh, is that... Uh, what is it? Capital 12 Cinemas. And it, it was yeah. sold out. And <laughs> sold out screening out. Friday night, Thin Red Line, because people thought it was um, Saving Private Ryan for the Pacific. And that's how yeah. it was marketed, mm -hmm. right? And just seeing the look on people's face by the end of the movie, I was absolutely hooked for the rest of my life. I was like, this guy's unbelievable. Gary, I, what's your history with Terrence Malick? Like, you got any, got any baggage there like I do? I, I don't, honestly. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, no offense to Terrence Malick. Uh, I, I just, uh, I just um, you know, I've seen stuff. I, I, I remember seeing the tree of life and being yeah. like, what, what, what is going on here? <laughs> and, uh, reaction. yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, thin red line was one. I, I mean, I, I remember watching it on, I worked in a video store at the time yeah. and I just remember seeing it enough and watching it enough. I've liked the stuff I've seen. I just, uh, he's never, I don't know what, why I just never have had like a, a major attach attachment to him. Yeah, and, and, and I've heard of this movie before, but I'd never seen this movie. Oh, before. so this is your first time. I love it. So yeah. what, what your initial, as you're watching it, what are your initial things that uh, were coming to mind when you're seeing this? Did you enjoy it? Did you, I, I did enjoy it. I thought it was really, really good. And, um, um, let's see. Um, I, the, the only part that drove me nuts a little bit is, is the, uh, her narration of yes. the story, like her yeah. reading it for some reason. I was just like, oh, wow, you were just deadpan reading this thing. And it's just, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I don't know. I, I think it's a choice, but it's just like, I don't know. So it, it was a weird one, but uh, no, I mean, I, I had thoughts like, uh, wow, Martin Sheen's always sounded like he smoked 12 packs a day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, in terms of like it, Badlands 2, I think is, you know, tying it back to kind of the Lolita thing. What's interesting about it is the original story here. I mean, it, just to be very basic in terms of what it's all about, it's a it's a Bonnie and Clyde sort of two people on the run from the law. They're in love with each other, uh, apparently, um, allegedly, allegedly. Uh, and you know, the the risque part here is not only the fact that like they're committing you know heinous murders, or at least he is. She doesn't do anything technically, right? Um, and that's part of it. But also, I think, you know, we got to tie back into Lolita a little bit. There's a pretty mm -hmm. big age difference here. Um, and I did not recall it at all because I hadn't seen the movie in years. Oh, you didn't recall that that part of it? No, because the age gap is another part that's fictionalized. There's a lot that's uh, fictionalized in this film, even though it's, once again, allegedly uh, based on the true story of Charles Starkweather and his uh younger but not underage um partner in crime or complicit in crime uh girlfriend and yet they decided for whatever reason to change it from like a you know 30 something 20 something age gap to a 31 15 
age gap, which uh, obviously in 2022 makes this film hit a little bit different. Yeah, I, I have to say that uh, you guys did not tell me the theme beforehand, so <laughs> I was I was trying to figure that out, uh, or at least if you told me, I, I don't remember. But I was I was watching then I was I was like, why these two? I wonder. And, uh, H-Cap so, cinema. Yeah, I was just like, wow, did they just they wanted to hit like each end of the spectrum here? I guess. Yeah, <laughs> like just no, totally. forbidden love and on, on too young and too old. I don't know. Unless you know, as I was watching Harold and Maude, I thought, well, maybe they go on a killing spree at some point. But, <laughs> it, it, you, yeah, you but, wouldn't put it past either of them at that point. Right. <laughs> right. Death does, the, 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 the concept of death does uh, connect both films, too, despite their wildly different tones. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, anytime, you know, Romeo and Juliet, right? It's all, like, sex, mm-hmm. love, and death are so intertwined in these sort of stories that it's like, they can't, they're hardly even separated. Um, yeah. I think it's interesting, too, that, like, it, when they cast... Um, Martin Sheen for this role, uh, Kit, the killer here in um, Badlands, he was originally pretty old. I think he was like, what, pushing 30, I want to say? Um, but the character is supposed to be 19, right? Um, and she's in high school. I mean, how do we feel about that part of it? Is that part of the risque thing going on here? Is that that age difference? Or is it so different than something like Lolita that it doesn't really sort of pop on the radar? Well... My initial kind of read on it, because this was my first time watching it with that like front and center, especially watching it on the heels of Lolita, um, was that you have to look at it. And I think it's there in the text. I don't think it's subtext. Like, this is not just the story. This is not a story of two people falling in love, I don't think. I think that's how I initially watched it when I was 21 or whatever. But it seems pretty clear Uh, And maybe that's, maybe it is, I don't know, whatever, text or subtext, who cares? It (laughs) seems like a story about, you know, a uh, easily impressionable, like just looking for dependency uh, young girl and uh, abuser that is taking her for his own journey. And she is this unwitting accomplice, not necessarily by choice, but by thinking i mean that's part of the themes of the film right is like their destiny and the way things are supposed to play play out and uh i i do not really see this as a romantic film <laughs> this is the second time anymore <laughs> two, two episodes in a row two episodes mm-hmm. in a row you've said that the main feature is not a romance film <laughs> correct <laughs> um, he doesn't really do a great job of wooing her or anything i mean i guess he does i think his his main attraction for everyone is that he looks like james dean correct. um so that's i don't know i i um I, the age thing didn't hit me quite as much, I have to say, um, because I, I remember the first time they're walking down the street, like she even says to him, uh, are you in school? And he says, like, no, nah, I got a job. And uh, so I, I think I was in my head thinking, like, maybe this guy just dropped out or something. Yeah. And- OK, to be clear, I had to look this up. So we're being specific because we've thrown out a lot of numbers. And uh, yes, we it is verified that holly is 15 um sissy space looks character martin sheen was 31 when he played kit kit is mentioned to be 25 in the script so it's a 10 so, year okay yeah so, so it's a 10 year age gap but like also yeah she's a minor she's a minor <laughs> like, Her, she is, it's not just a 10 year age, <laughs> age gap there's like statutory rape involved like there's all uh-huh. like that, but, yeah yeah uh, yeah, there's a lot, a lot going on it's there. It's not kosher. Yeah, it's, the, it's the licorice pizza of the 70s. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> oh, no. The PTA slide. Um, okay, so uh, one thing that sort of sticks out to me in this movie, like, have you guys, what's the last time you guys saw Bonnie and Clyde? Have you seen Bonnie and Clyde? <sighs> yeah, probably about 10, 12 years ago. Or think about any of these sort of like... Um, uh, road, true, true romance. Yeah, road romance, yeah, romance crime course. things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How does this uh, I, I've always like because at the end of the day, like this is definitely I think um, it's genre E in that sense that it's like it's taking a pretty simple kind of rote um, story uh, structure and idea in doing a lot of things that are a little bit different that would normally be done. Uh, 
do you guys, I don't know, like, um, do you feel like the core genre part of this, the crime part of it kind of sticks together or is Terry already kind of going off <laughs> in his little paintings of uh, landscapes and stuff like that, where the main story kind of loses it? I mean, that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, where I really feel like this movie is the Terrence Malick movie that can bring everyone together because <laughs> it does that genre thing. I mean, it's 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 interesting. I don't I, I can't really wrap my head around. Uh, I mean, the man's a mystery, but like, how does he go from being like a Heidegger philosophy instructor yeah. and dissertation writer to wanting to make a, a serial killer movie, essentially? Obviously, once you see it, you're like, oh, this there's more going on here than just an entertaining escapist story about, you know, two lovers on the run killing people. Um, but it does feel like that those two worlds, like the the industries, and that's the magic of 70s American cinema yeah, in general, right? Like The Godfather is probably the biggest example of that. Like take something scandalous and sensational and marry it with something deeper and humanistic but also like very kind of dark and psychological yeah i remember reading a quote from him while i was looking up stuff about this movie and it was uh, and i should have jotted it down but it was something along the lines of he was saying you know he he thought nostalgia is really powerful but it could like drown it anything that it's attached to and so he was he was into that concept, but he actually tried to avoid it if he could. He wanted it to be more of a fairy tale and outside time. And I remember him talking about that kind of thing. So he was he was definitely in that this dreamy feel about some of the stuff. Like uh, I don't know, I don't know if heightened reality is the way to yeah say would, it or something. I would but, agree yeah, totally without a doubt. Like the music, the xylophone music. So um, awesome. yeah. yeah, like wonderful, interesting. Like it's almost like, and they create that little snow globe world when they're in the woods, right? And the tree fort and all that kind of stuff, and the yeah. tree house, and like it. Um, he takes the story in such an odd direction because normally, when you're making a film about crime and about murder and about something sensational, you want the sensational part of it. The crime here and the violence is actually super understated. And like even like the first murder when he kills her father, spoiler alert, happens really quick. Um, <laughs> it's so understated. Or the time when um, he seemingly kills the young couple who he forces down into the storm cellar. Right. He pushes, yeah. you know, he doesn't push them down there, but he's basically you got to go down, you go down there. He closes the door, locks it, kind of tricks them and then starts shooting into the top. Just two shots. And even he doesn't know if you hit them or not. There's just something so strange about how Malik depicts the violence here that I think he's trying to avoid sensationalizing it almost and making it look like it's a simple thing, but mm -hmm. it has like such a dramatic sort of repercussion to it. I don't know. Does that sort of track with what you guys saw in the movie? Yeah. I think that one of the biggest kind of parallels to what you're talking about is comes from the fact that uh, not only like he comes from the world of philosophy rather than the world of film. Um, but when critics were obviously comparing Badlands at the time to movies like Bonnie and Clyde, uh, he, one of the few quotes he gave was to sight and sound um, in 75 uh, reflecting on that and like not understanding why all those correlations were making that people were making to like French new wave and film noir. He was like, my influences were the Hardy boys, Swiss family, Robinson, <laughs> Tom Sawyer. Like he, he's looking at this through this like really strange lens. And yet it makes complete sense along the lines of what you were saying, Gary, about the, the kind of fairy tale sensibility because he sees those connections and he's able to uh, draw that out in a very influential way, I think, where it's like not just that those scenes of violence are simple, but also, I mean, Martin Sheen's performance is key to it, right? Because he has this kind of vacant, like void inside of him that's like expressed through every slight mannerism and line delivery. And through his murders that it just feels like it, it, it's a it's a knock over the head where it's like these. Pe yes, they, these people are doing evil things, but are like 
it just seems like they're just doing it based on, you know, casual impulse rather than, you know, any kind of, you know, sensational premeditation that is advertised in so many other areas of the media. It's so weird. The, the way you guys are describing it, it's, it's perfect. Um, because I, I just, I, I don't know, I hadn't pieced it together how I thought about it, but I think, yeah, like the dad the, shooting the dad um, is probably the most violent part of it. I, I think um, like that's the, the one that they get the closest to. I feel like showing everything, the whole process and that it, the, when it first happens, you're just kind of like, wow, that's out of nowhere. Yeah, but, you yeah, know, exactly. Like he didn't, he didn't provoke, you know, I guess he's provoking you, but I don't know. It's just weird. It just kind of happens. And then, but it's never like, you know, it's not a slasher movie or anything. And it's never like, uh, yeah, it's, it's so interesting the way he shoots it and the way he, he deals with it. And you're dealing more with like, uh, what you were saying, Chris, about like Martin Sheen's vacant, uh, way about himself that he deals with it. And even Sissy Spacek is just kind of, I don't know. It's just like a passing thing for them. Um, it's, I don't know. It's really interesting. And I, I, I didn't have words for it and still don't apparently, but you guys did. So that was great. <laughs> well, I think there, the violence is definitely, it's very flat in a lot of ways, but I think we got to go back to the romance part of this, Chris. I don't know. You don't want oh, to, damn it. but we're going to go back to it because, you know, there is some aspect to their attraction to each other, their relationship that they have to each other. It is romantic. Now, it is intertwined with a sociopath committing, like, horrible acts of murder, but there is romance involved um, because the reality is she could have left at any moment. At any moment in this entire crime spree, she could have just walked away. But she doesn't, right? So there is something drawing her, and what draws her to Kit in the first place? You know, why doesn't she immediately run when he shoots her father to death right in front of her. Cause where's she going to go? She could go anywhere. That's the thing. She just, she's a 15 year old girl in like boat podunk, South Dakota. Like it's, it's just like, that's, I think if anything, this like igniting of dependency, like that's the ultimate act that he can do as a manipulator. Once again, probably subconscious cause of that vacant, um, sure. Nature of himself. But like, she it just seems like that it's like she doesn't have any other options we're not given any suggestion that there's other family in town or that she's you know has any kind of uh, a way to survive in the world without some kind of male counterpart and so it's just i mean it, it, it you could look at it in this almost like this twisted um marriage that occurs of oh, like absolutely. literally the yeah. father walking her down the, the stairway instead of the aisle. And then the, the new husband shoots the father so that he can take her away and they can start their life together. Yeah. It's weird. Cause she, she kind of mentions calling the cops, I think when he dies and then, um, you know, Martin Sheen's kind of in this way of like, you know, or I think he specifically says like, you can, if you want to call the police, yeah. you, that's fine, but not going to be good for me. And it's almost like she's fascinated with him. Oh, damn. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and that's, that's what drives her in this. And so, like, the idea of, oh, well, he'll be going away if I call the cops. So she wants to ride it out a little bit more. And no, no, I kind of felt that a lot. Like, it was just this fascination for her, this whole other world or something that she eventually, I guess, gets just kind of like, all right, I've seen it. I'm done. I don't know. And, and she does choose to she not leaves. go with him to the yeah. final end, right? She leaves at uh, the end, right? She makes yes, that choice yes. by the end to be like, you know, this is probably a bridge too far. Right? You've murdered <laughs> how many people in front of me and I've done nothing to do anything. Well, the also, also the other thing, too, is does she say anything to stop him? Does she say anything to make him think about what he's doing? The only reaction she really has is she slaps him in the face after he kills her father. She goes, he goes, you know what I mean? Like, that's it. And yeah. so it's sort of I, like, that's, I think, one of the weird allures of this movie is that um, the characters ultimately, they're, they're very complex, but they're just so unlikable. And there's something about them that reads it seems honest in a way like that's how people probably would act. You know, maybe she is under the spell of him. He's obviously a sociopath. He's obviously an abuser, 
but she does have some agency in this. Like she is kind of being a part of it. And I will point out that in the, in the actual story of this, uh, Charles Starkweather and Carol Ann uh, Fugit, uh, she's sentenced to life in prison. Mm-hmm. And he's given the the chair essentially. So I, I just I want to I think that's one of the more interesting aspects of the film because like how would this film play different if she was sort of screaming the entire time and saying I don't want to be around you I want to run away and he's like you know holding her down so like she's not he's not doing any of that right right she's just there with it and for whatever reason she's going along with it. Um, and I think that like that, I think ultimately as you dive deeper into that, like, yeah, then it becomes very unromantic, right? Because right. it's, and, it's a power dynamic. And we, we kind of touched on this with the opening episode, but it, I mean, there's a reason that these kinds of risque romances happen in films that maybe not, aren't actually romantic in the traditional literal sense, but they have this romanticism around them right like clearly there's this yes you know question that's you know arguably became very prevalent in the mainstream in the 70s about uh you know this the the glorification of violence in media and you have uh two characters that while yes are not likable um i think that's fair to say no matter what decade you're in or what vantage point you have and yet still like there's charm to both of them yeah. right even all the way to the end like it's it's literally grappled with in um that closing scene of uh them being brought to the uh, military base and being treated especially kit like a celebrity yeah and martin sheen just feeding off of it and like smiling and uh, giving away his comb and all that. It just seems like it, it was really ahead of its time in that sense because that was introduced around the same time but really wasn't grappled with um, and it, in a in a more like mainstream discourse kind of way, I think, until the Reagan era, if not later, right? Oh, it's so weird you're saying that too. I, I'm, I'm, I, I appreciate you guys' insight. No, um, I, w- I was thinking of just as you were saying that, I was like, wow, it really is kind of like got the natural born killers thing there at oh, the yeah. end too. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I didn't, that didn't hit me till right now, but yeah, it's, it's so, it's so odd. And, and, and you're right. I don't think that either of them are very likable. And maybe that, I think that detached way they handle everything is it is, I feel like both of them are really self-absorbed. Like it is yes. all about them and they, and, and so even with her, she's just, it is almost like she just dished her dad for him. It's like, all right, well on to the next thing. Like she's just fascinated yeah. and moving along to whatever interest cat or, you know, whatever captures her interest at the time. And, uh, she's not saying anything or doing anything. She's just like along for the ride and just watching. She's not concerned with any of the victims or anything. It doesn't ever seem like, and neither of them seem like they ever really cared that much. That's just like a thing they do uh, along this ride. They're just wanting to see, what's out there in the world, I guess, or what's there for them. It, what's interesting too, is like, they never, uh, Kit never thinks he's going to get away with it. No. Right. It's always leading towards the inevitable, like death and capture. Um, and, and I think the, the fame part of this, the fame seeking, uh, is so, um, is so strong at the end. And it is kind of strange a little bit thinking about this is pre-cable TV, pre-internet, obviously. Like, in that era, you know, is there another, is like, is there another example of something like maybe network of something Mm -hmm. like sort of this really um, surgical sort of criticism of image uh, and the power that it has, I, I feel like he is Malik's way ahead of his time, like way, 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 like because this to me actually feels more critical of now than maybe it did back then. Um, yeah. Because like I mean, just think about the thing that kept sticking into my head is when at the end there, when Kid is you know shaking the cops' hands, they were shooting at each other like an hour before ready to kill each other shaking his hand and the comb aspect and the way that he puts the hat on before he gets captured or he puts he places the rocks by the side of the road this is where you caught me remember this here it is he reminded me of influencers 
right? And like, <laughs> yeah, like the unbelievable. It's and Gary, you said this, it's the detachment, right? It's mm-hmm. I exist in the world, I matter, I'm in my little bubble, everything else doesn't really exist. And so then you, you get that really strange, surreal identity thing going on where they're creating an identity in real time through images that isn't real at all. It's just made up. And like, I don't know. That's why I think this movie and, and Malika general is one of those guys who you're just like, wow, you go back to it over and over again. You're like, this is, this is something different. I mean, can you guys think of anything from the seventies that kind of would hit along the similar ideas in this? There's gotta be something. I was trying to think of something, but I think you, you, I mean, you're right. Like it, it's, it's weird because this is what, so 73. So, I mean, I I don't know of anything that's tackled it in this way, and you could have gone in any way with this, and or made it like a, you know, like overly leaned into a love story or uh, the Bonnie and Clyde type thing or or whatever. But it's it's about something more than that, and they're, um, yeah, it's weird. I, I can't think of anything else, and it's so funny to think that this guy did this, and I I, I wish I had read more of the reviews around this. I was wondering if anybody's picking up on that because you're, you're about to head into the decade of slasher movies and horror and like the violence is just going to become like a thing you glory. I don't want to say glorify cause I don't want to sound like one of those people, but you know what I mean? Like it, it just, it, it's like, I don't know. I feel like there's going to be about a, a, a hundreds of thousands of movies that are about to come after this one that are just going to be like, not even thinking about stuff like this. Yeah. And, uh, and so we finally get there again, but it, it's, it is interesting. I didn't realize like this early on, I, I think he is tackling a lot of those other things besides like using this as a platform to discuss. Yeah. The, basically, like you said, influencer culture before influencer culture came around. No. And the other like current event thing that stood out to me, it almost hit me like a ton of bricks going back to that scene where, um, Martin Sheen's character is basically being treated like a celebrity and being handled so gently by the cops. Um, You know, the worst thing they do is throw his hat out the window, but then especially the cops that don't apprehend him as they uh, adore him at the uh, military base. um, You get, I had this flashback to the whole Dylan roof thing, the, yeah, uh, the the shooter in South Carolina church. And then they like bought him a hamburger uh, on, on the way to the jail cell. And so there's this, like, it, it, that's one of the things about like the timelessness of, uh, Badlands, not just in the sense of how much it influenced movies, but how, like, there's so many different parallels oh, to, it, and it's so subtle. Like there, there's not even like really a mention of like the, it, of a news report, but like media is so gently placed, uh, in parallel with all the usual Malik, like nature things. Yeah. Um, the 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 whole like recording his fake suicide message on the dictaphone uh scene was really um unique and strange and yet still just like another example of uh, a very kind of casual um relationship that kit has with um you know he he admits to murdering the dad like that's part of his fake suicide plan yeah. it's like admitting murdering the dad uh, and wanting that recording to be found uh um, after the fire. And then also this like really, um, kind of, uh, almost going back to like the romantic romanticizing thing, like where he, uh, hears Nat King Cole on the radio and then like pulls over, uh, to dance to it. Yeah. And it, it kind of acts with, in concert with that whole James Dean aesthetic thing where it's like the, the greasers, you know, yeah. uh, because it, it, you know, it's it took it came out in seventy three, but is this? Yeah, are we meant to believe that this is the fifties that being depicted? Well, that's a good like, question. Yeah. I don't know. That's a really good question. I guess it could be, couldn't it? There's nothing there to indicate that it's in the seventies, right? Right. Yeah, I feel like maybe somewhere I did see they were going for the fifties, right? Yeah, because so, it kind of seems yeah. that way. And speaking of the fifties, the other the, you were talking about like movies maybe around this time or earlier that like did this kind of. Uh, tackling of um the the corruption of media since the sensationalism uh it made me think of ace in the hole the the wilder film yeah absolutely and how that and once again that's the guy that was like ahead of his time right way ahead of his Um, time yeah so there 
it's it's just there, there's so many things i think we do have to mention not to uh, to pivot too much before we start talking to harold and Maud, but yeah. uh, I, I i did mention earlier that i had very few criticisms but i do have to say like just as we always do when we research like the production of these films um like malik because it was his debut feature because he's a quote maverick aka i mean that's that's industry talk for asshole right <laughs> um he he didn't know what he was doing no idea and he he's he's running his crew ragged he had horrible working conditions no union non union no union special effects guy gets like halfway burned to death in that fire scene so like it just sucks that like this here's this perfect movie that is like and also, I think previously, maybe not so much anymore, but there was, uh, you know, a good few decades where it was like, you know, we we uh, glorified overworking and um, the labor of love thing. And yet, it, I mean, he also went like twice over budget. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was supposed to be 350. But at the end of the day, uh, Billy Weber, the producer, said on the Criterion um, commentary that it was probably closer to 700. <laughs> so like... I he he he's he was unhinged from the get go. Even though he was able to balance those sensitive sensibilities. Were you um, saying? Are you saying that Malik is like this? This picture is almost autobiographical for him. <laughs> like he's he's detached and he's he's just yeah, focused on yeah. getting his message out there. He's he's basically Martin yeah. Sheen recording into the dictaphone. <laughs> he, like saw, he saw the special effects guy carried away in the stretcher and just said, "Oh, look at that! Don't tell anybody." Well, it it's might funny. Get me in trouble. Like Malik, it, it's such a weird dichotomy or juxtaposition with him because, like, you hear Martin uh, Sheen talk about this movie and he gushes. Oh yeah, he's like it changed my life. He was crying when he got the role. Still says it was the best script he ever read. Yeah, exactly. And but then you listen to like Christopher Plummer off of was a New World, and he's like, I would Mm. never work with that man ever again. (laughs) Right. So it's like this weird two faced thing going on with Mm -hmm. Malik. And like I don't know, like I as a huge Malik fan, and like I love Heidegger. I love that sort of philosophy that he was into. Um, I have to say that like his first three films, uh, I'll say first four, let's say Badlands, Days of Heaven, uh, Thin Red Line, uh, and The New World, I think are all like, to me, masterpieces. But since then, uh, kind of like Romero did, kind of disappeared <laughs> off his own ass a little bit, you know, and like the quality <laughs> kind of this like dissipated very rapidly. The more he and, worked, the, wor- yes. the worse it got. And I'm and I'm a tree of life apologist, oh, knowing totally well, yeah. oh, all its all its trappings. I but like, I saw To the Wonder in 2012, yeah. and I was like, okay, I'm. I think I'm good with Malik for now because <laughs> that movie is. That, I mean, you have. Did you see To the Wonder? No. Okay, I good. haven't seen a lot of the recent ones because the Tree of Life. I almost walked. I out haven't, of. and I've heard a Hidden Life is his return to form. But I still am so nervous to touch it because I haven't watched anything since To the Wonder. Yeah. Um, All right, let's pivot. Let's pivot to... uh, uh, I would say Badlands is a classic with, like, film nerds and film bros, probably, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But not amongst a a wider set. I think Harold and Maude uh, has a bigger reputation, right? Yeah, I think it does. It, it, not in like the auteurist sense, though there are, is argument that it should be part of that conversation. But uh, especially in terms of just like, you know, good vibes movies, like the the kind of like less uh, cynical, more kind of hopeful, uh, colorful, playful musical films um, of the cult classic canon. And yeah, and yet neither of you had seen this one. I, when I was uh, recording Cinema Shock the other day, um, and I told uh, uh, my co-host Justin that I was, I was like, I'm going to go back on with the Film Trace guys. And uh, he's like, what are you guys talking about? And I told him, Badlands and Harold and Maude. He was like, wow, Harold and Maude. He was like, have you seen that? And I was like, no. And he's like, that's like the, the OG cult film. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was like, I can't believe you've ever seen that. But this is interesting. I did not. I, I I'd heard of the movie, but yeah, I don't know why I'd never seen it. Okay, so so just to to prep, since I was this is a, I'm the only one that had a rewatch, and then I'd love to hear your guys' first impressions. Um, I mean, as a lot of people <laughs> of my generation, yeah. it was a pretty straightforward line from 
I got obsessed with Wes Anderson. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I hear I hear I hear about Harold and Maude, and so I have to see it to see what inspired like the the guy I was worshiping at age fifteen. And yeah, I mean I I I, I was transfixed. Uh, it was a movie that I was very nervous to watch because while I was excited since it had the connection to Wes Anderson's influences, it also was literally about like a 19 year old kid falling in love with a 79 year old woman. And that seemed way off base. But then as soon as you watch it, you're like, Oh my gosh, that's Max Fisher. Oh my gosh, that's Luke Wilson's character. in Royal <laughs> Tenenbaums. And so like it, the, the, that's one of the, the amazing magic tricks of movies is, and they kind of, that's what kind of Terry Malick does with Badlands is like makes you, step away from the thing that on its face should be shocking, controversial and, you know, disgusting and makes you just like really love humans. <laughs> and it's just so uh, warm and friendly and just like wholesome that you're like, how, how is a movie that's so like on its surface subversive and, you know, anti mainstream also just so, uplifting and oh wow uh, this is going to be a tough one chris i i i chris I you're, you're speaking so intelligently and i think what the listeners really want to know is are you hooking up with sissy spacek or ruth gordon <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what we're here to talk about oh, oh god <laughs> i think it sounds like it, he's made his choice is what it sounds like <laughs> it does so, <laughs> I, he just wrote a love letter right here on air i i did i did so so first impressions oh uh, no chris i don't okay so here's the deal I'm the same as you, man. Like, I super got into Wes Anderson. Rushmore is, like, my favorite movie for, like, a decade. And that's how I heard about this movie. Now, if I had seen it back then, I might have a different reaction to how I'm seeing it now. Hmm. Um, because, like, back then, yeah, the, the blueprint for Wes Anderson's all here. It's the quirkiness. It's, like, you're in the world, but you're in a kind of a snow globe world, too. Kind of going back to Badlands a bit. Uh, it's a little bit of a magical realism sort of fantasy thing going on. Um... Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it, and I knew the entire premise of the whole thing uh, going into it. So I and heard it from so many different directions. It just didn't land, I think, in the way that I wanted it to. It, and maybe that's also me reckoning with my own sort of relationship to that the twee film world of the early two thousands mm. and all the indies during that time period. Maybe there was something about those movies that weren't so great. <laughs> that's probably what I'm going to say about Harold and Maude. Maybe there's some parts to this that we need to rethink a little bit. Uh, but before I go into that, Gary, what did you think? I, I actually enjoyed this movie. I thought it was, it was very sweet. And, uh, yeah. um, but it, it, um, you know, and it, and, and I'll say this up front, nobody's going to like this, but I don't like Wes Anderson movies that much. All right, there you go. There you go. That's like, I'm, I'm not that big That's of a fair. fan of, of his stuff, but I totally got that when I was watching this. I was like, oh, this is, this is where that guy came from. Yeah. And, uh, but I mean, he's got some stuff I like. Uh, I mean, but it just, you know, it, sometimes I don't. I don't want to use the wrong word. I'm sure he's a very nice guy. Sometimes it all just gets a little pretentious or weird yeah, for me. And sure. uh, yeah, and but but this one, I mean, I could see why people would think that. But I thought this one played played it pretty well, like the whole way through. And uh, and and I bought in on uh, the performances and just the the story that was being told. I was shocked. That they they literally like or that they actually hooked up, you know. I did not I did not know that was coming, and I was like, wow, they they went for it. All right, so <laughs> yeah, but they, no, I, I actually enjoyed it. Yeah, it's it's uh, and t let's talk about the romance part of this. I mean, obviously, like, um, you know, Harold's down and out. He's depressed. He fakes committing suicide to get attention from his mother, or at least to get a rise out of her. Um. There, you know, and then he goes to funerals. Essentially, why do did is it determined why he goes to funerals? Is, did he explicitly say emotionally why he does it? I don't remember. When they're smoking hook hookah, yeah, um, he tells the story about walking away from the fire, yeah, and feeling like it. He tells his mom at a, at a young age, like that that he died, yeah, and so he has ever since that traumatic moment been obsessed with death and his own like being in control of his own death and all that. So the, 
that kind of obsession then converges with mods uh, what we find out later to be you know plan to commit suicide when she turns 80 spoiler alert for 1971 <laughs> movie um and 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 honestly that i i felt this pit in my stomach all over again i also hadn't watched this movie in probably over a decade yeah. uh and that pit in my stomach is and i think that's what makes the movie ultimately work and click not that it all hinges on one scene but th that's where the emotional climax happens when uh she's taken to the hospital uh and um harold played by bud court is driving his hearse uh which is just his regular car and he we see it go over a cliff and it's you know, should I feel like that's something that shouldn't work on paper where it's like the camera pulls back and reveals that Harold's actually at the top of the cliff and he let the car go. But it, it, it works because it's that hearse and because of Maud's um, kind of closing speech to him uh, the night before where she says, you know, go love some more. And he, he finally lets go of his obsession with death, both by, you know, uh, not only putting letting the car the hearse go over the cliff but also in that uh in, incredible incredible scene where he uh commits seppuku fake uh and <laughs> the it, he finally meets his match with this girl that uh then performs going back to your mention of romeo and juliet yeah. juliet's you know exactly. dying monologue and so it, cl it clearly like that that's killed out of him he loses mod he gets rid of the hearse and I mean, yes, once again, your, your mileage is going to vary with the amount of twee, but he plays a banjo and cute cat banjo. Steven. <laughs> and, and prances off into the, the sunset, it's, I guess. It's, it's, uh, it's, it, it's one of those things where it's like, how much sugar can you take? And I can take a lot. Well, I know other people can. Yeah, it's, it's bitter and sweet, though. I mean, it is a very pretty dark film at the same time. It's a black comedy. It's not like, yeah. it's not that yeah, yeah. whimsical. I didn't find it very whimsical at all, actually. No, that and that's the funny depressing. thing. Right. And I think I mean, that, I mean, I mean, watching Royal Tenenbaums hits different. Uh, we talked about this. We did an episode about it, right? Yeah. It's different in our mid thirties than it did when we were teenagers. And there is a lot of that darkness there. And uh, I think that the whole idea of twee and whimsical cinema is uh, misunderstood and mis is maligned. I think despite the fact that there is so much, uh, that's wrapped up in death and contemplation and self-reflection. Yeah. Um, what yeah, what do we know. make of his journey here? So like he goes from this, I, I guess he's probably clinically depressed. Is that safe to say? If yeah. Armchair psychologist version. He's, yeah. You know, he's suicidal ideation. He's playing out suicide. Like it's a pretty, yeah. like pretty close to like a, a textbook case of, of depression. Um, and then this woman comes along in his life in the, you know, the manic pixie dream thing is it's a trope and ideology thing for a reason, because it's like a woman comes along to a sad young man and then sort of changes his life. I and mean, obviously mm -hmm. there's like uh, some good with that, but there's also, I think in the last 15 years, especially after Elizabeth town, of course, uh, <laughs> with the term really got uh, coined, there's a lot of negative to, to go along with that. Sure. Um, I guess, do you, uh, Gary, Chris, did you see any sort of, and maybe throw in the romance part of this, do we see any sort of, um, I don't know, is it... Uh... I was definitely, I was definitely going to say it's all about who you hit your wagon to guys. Cause it's, it's, uh, you know, like it's, you can, you can get the girlfriend that just, uh, that just goes along with whatever. And it's just like, I'll do what you want to do, honey. Yeah, and then yeah. you end up like badlands or you can, <laughs> you can get the girlfriend who doesn't put up with your bullshit and then you can have Harold and Maude and you can turn out, you stop you from being a serial killer. <laughs> Or or actually committing suicide, right? Yeah, right, exactly. That's the thing too. It's sort of like, um, yeah. I mean, the thing that like stuck out to me. I'm gonna I'm gonna say this, and I know it's probably a stupid thing to say. I'm gonna get groans for it, uh, <laughs> but I have to because it's something that popped into my head specifically. Reverse the genders of these two characters. Uh, <laughs> I I mean, you have to think. I mean. No, Chris, tell me why. Tell me why. Why can't we do that? No, I mean, you can play that if we did this game all day long with every story. Well, that's all but written. I mean, come on. This is a, <laughs> it's a pretty clear 
like you're talking the, what 60 years difference like if a if oh a i'm nine, with you if a yeah, 19 yeah. year old girl met a 79 year old man in the same mm-hmm. exact way went through the same exact things how would we feel different about it well we yes we all know how we would feel differently about it but that's because there's the, the history of gender roles and the patriarchy and abuse and so I, I mean, it's it's not that way for a reason. I think Hal Ashby's a smart enough guy to know that, like, this script from this random – I saw this in your notes, Dan, the, uh, this pool cleaner. Um, <laughs> that's amazing. The, that's the the origins. It's like pool yeah. cleaner's like, I have an idea for a movie. And the producer whose pool he's cleaning is like, oh, yeah, well, I'll buy it. Um, <laughs> Talk about patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but Hal Ashby is also the guy that did Being There. He's also the guy, you know, that did uh, Coming Home. So, like – yeah. He is – he's acutely aware, I think, more so than most filmmakers um, in this time period of that. And I think, honestly, Terrence Malick was too. Yeah. Uh, I you, you do the same question for that movie. And, of course, yeah, it doesn't – it it doesn't work. It, the, it, it wouldn't exist. Um, well, the question because... is why doesn't it work, right? Because it's like <laughs> – Think about it this way. If, like, the same, like, literally the same movie in two different genders in that way, like, why wouldn't it work for Hale and Maud? I think it could work for Badlands, like, potentially, but it, it wouldn't work. It could definitely work for Badlands. I think for Harold and Maud, there's no way you could get an audience to go along with it. Whereas right. with Harold and Maud, they'll go along with it because, why is that, though? Like, why would we go along with it? Or well, why I guess we go go back to our cold open. I mean, is it is it Freud? Is that why we can well, go along no, with it? But Freud goes both ways, right? Like, it's like it, it can go either way. It's just sort of fascinating to me that we would see a 79-year-old woman as sort of, is she not, like, predatory in this? She doesn't see I was going to say, I think it, it, it does. I mean, it, it, it's, you know you were talking about the groans or whatever, but yeah, like, I mean, I think there is the, the built in thing that like a guy, I don't know. You just assume the men are more predatory yeah, than always. women. And so it just, not that it can't be the other way around, but the, the standard, I guess is uh, the men. I don't know. So I, I guess you're just wired that way to be like more put off by, well, I don't know, but maybe you're right. Maybe it's a, uh, I don't know. Maybe go, go, like why we shouldn't give Sissy Spacek too much credit for she didn't do any, she didn't commit any crimes. But you know, she was there. She was watching. She was, she was cool. She was yeah. <laughs> but she was a fifteen-year-old girl. Like I don't know. Um, uh, no, going don't, back to don't your, feel sorry for her. Yeah, she has agency. <laughs> she has agency. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to tell to my son when he fucks up when he's fifteen. <laughs> going straight. Um, <laughs> Going back to what you were saying, Gary, about like wondering if they would actually take it there since this was yeah. their first watch. Like, um, and, and you know, Badlands arguably ha- you you see that a lot earlier, and like it's obvious initial sexual attraction um, at the beginning of the film. Whereas here, there's just like so much uh, wholesome friendship happening between mm-hmm. uh, Harold and Maude throughout the film that there aren't those really like cues, those dependency cues, yeah. those toxic relationships, Stockholm syndrome, like none of that stuff is happening here. And they like culminate their relationship with sex. Whereas, you know, in a, a lot of other uh, stories and movies, you don't have that kind of, yeah. they, they don't take the time to lay all this groundwork. And sure. going back also to the manic pixie dream girl thing, the one thing, you know, the huge element I think that uh, Harold and Maud doesn't fall victim to is that Maud's character has her own arc. And there is a lot of like um, depth to her uh, from, you know, the, the, the Auschwitz tattoo that goes unremarked um, but revealed um, to, uh, you know, her um, – her own choices in her life uh, from, you know, how she keeps her home to how she uh, tells stories about her um, late husband. Like there's, there's way more happening here that balances the tables, even though you could very still, very easily still make the argument that, you know, it's Harold's story front and center. Yeah. She is a full supporting character and you don't usually see that in other movies, no matter what the, the gender dynamics are. Yeah. In a romance. 
I mean, it's it's fascinating too. It's like the blueprint for movies like this is everything in Harold and Maude, but not the sex. Right? Like the sex part yeah. of it is mm-hmm. what it makes it so it, it just takes it in a very different direction because we see this over and over again in films. It's a mentoring relationship. Right? Like there's right. in it. Oh man, it raises so many different questions, which I think it's such a great choice to talk about in risque romance, <laughs> because it's just sort of like she is in a, you know, she's in the she has wisdom, she's lived a full life, and like she wants to help Harold see life in a different way, and she's there kind of as like a, like a guide, a mentor, in sort of the sexual part of that. It, it seems like it's such a fascinating card to play because you could have easily made this movie without that one scene. How does it change? Right. How does it really alter the the ending even like literally just remove that whatever 15 second shot. (laughs) What's it's it's really crazy too, is that, well, cause I think like right before that they do the, they're watching fireworks and he gives her the thing that says Harold loves mod and all that stuff. And uh, there's the leaning on each other. I mm-hmm. thought that was maybe as far as it goes. And yeah. uh, then they actually take yeah. that next step. And uh, it's, it's interesting because of the dynamic of their age. And then it's like, they, they actually play into that a little bit because after, you know, he's where the character would normally be like the guy'd be smoking a cigarette or something. She's like asleep and he's blowing bubbles. So I was like watching that and I was like, wow, they're like leaning into it now. <laughs> like they're just, yeah. they're, they're really into this. Family. Like, Hey, yeah. get it. He is really young. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it helps that that's where it helps that it's a comedy, like an out and out comedy. Yes. Right. Yes. You, you know, it, you, you couldn't do that in a movie that, played it straight like even like i know i made a joke about it earlier but uh it's interesting to to, to look back at that horrible discourse about licorice pizza sure. and see this really like in that movie is arguably you know out and out comedy and yet there's like pta does enough dramatic things takes it takes the situation seriously enough you know along with the racism in that movie that it's like what nobody knows what to think of it and it it but they all in mean, going back to Harold and Maud it feels like there's uh, uh, a reasoning that can be found like literally in the whole arc of what Maud is trying to teach Harold about living his life uh, it, not in terms of morals and not in terms of uh, you know what's accepted right and so like if you're literally like having one of the characters be that explicit about um, moralizing, then it becomes a lot, I don't know, for me, it come, becomes a lot easier to be like, okay, that this movie knows what it is, knows what it's doing. And so it doesn't, it, then I don't have that like kind of problematic baggage with it. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I still wonder, yeah. I still wonder if it would, could you do it now? Um, and that's no, what, it, or like immediately, not. like Twitter is going to be like, no, you couldn't do it now. This is about grooming. Like this <laughs> yeah. woman is grooming him the whole time. There's no way. Like I think the seventies, specifically the sixties. I mean, this what the you know the sexual revolution happens in what the late sixties, mm-hmm. early seventies. This is part of that, right? This yeah. is part of like opening up those ideas of you know relationships and sex and what it means to people and what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, what's moral, what's not moral. Uh, there's no way in hell you can make this movie. <laughs> you just couldn't do it. I don't know, Chris. What do you think? Could you do it? No, no, I I, I agree. And uh, Yusuf, formerly Cat Stevens, yes. did an interview about the anniversary of the film for Yahoo last year. And he, I mean, the, the, the guy's strange we, already because he's gone through his own kind of identity crisis um, over the years professionally, publicly. And he was asked that very same question, you know, could could Harold and Maude happen today? Um, and it, by all other instances, he says yes, except for when it comes to <laughs> switching the gender roles. He's like, oh, yeah, you could definitely make it today. He says, you might say the variety of relationships that people have these days. I don't know if it really would make any impact. But then the interview is like, well, OK, so what if it was a 79 year old guy? And he's like, oh, that's a no, no. That's strange. But it somehow feels different, doesn't it? <laughs> So it's almost as when as like kind of dark and whimsical as the film itself, because you have this um, 
the, I mean, going back to like the the word timeless, you it's amazing that both of these films still exist, you know, 50 some years later and we still are able to have these conversations. In fact, they're arguably even more layered and deep than they were back then. Yeah. I think with Harold and Maude specifically, it's like it, it was abject failure on release because they didn't market it. They didn't know how to market it. Yeah. But then it was through the New York Times has a great article about this when the movie actually uh, turned a profit uh, through all these sort of midnight showings. And your city, Chris, is like sort of famous for making this film oh, really? um, popular. It ran Amazing. in one theater, I forget, some, West something, like a, like a old school theater. It ran for like, I want to say, 100 weeks or something uh, straight. Yeah, it was like, and it got so bad that the people in the community started picketing to say change the movie. But it was, <laughs> it was a movie, and there's like another uh, story about how one of the producers or something met a guy uh, who basically said, you got me through college. I had a print of this movie and played it in uh, charge people to see it on college. It, this movie was the original cult film because it grew from this sort of underground completely. Um, the the studio didn't want to do anything to do with this thing, but it was through just people seeing it and seeing it, you know, 20, 30, 40 times that it, it really changed a lot of people's lives. I would say like Harold and Walt probably saved a lot of people's lives too. Um, and it's one of those films, you know, where I think um, it has this unbelievable impact uh, not just on Wes Anderson's style, but on all these people, you know, uh, growing up who were of college age, you know, in the 70s and 80s. And we're seeing this at midnight movies. It really it really is a cultural touchdown at this point. Um, whereas Badlands, I don't know. Is, is Badlands a cultural like icon? I don't know. Uh, just for people that have seen Zodiac too many times. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, it's hard to hate. Like, I, I, I listen to you talk about that and I'm like, man, I cannot imagine that a movie like this runs for a hundred weeks. Like what, yeah. who watches this movie that many times? But then again, maybe the world, you know, needs those earnest movies. We did a Wachowski series and I've always hated speed racer. Like I've always hated that movie. And I watched it this last time and there was something about it that like got me. Um, you guys have thrown out terms like the twee and yeah. stuff like that. But there was something in like speed racer where I'm like, the Wachowskis is just making like an earnest like friendly movie. Like they're just trying to make a positive (laughs) fun movie. And so I remember like coming to terms with, man, I can't hate on this. Like, you know, like the people need this sometimes it can't all be, you know, deep and dark and weird all the time, you know, like maybe sometimes people need like something uplifting and just a, a fun, nice story. And so maybe that's where we were at the world in the world at that time. Maybe that particular, maybe where Chris is from is just really depressed and needed some help. And so, <laughs> <laughs> well, hell yeah, it's Minnesota. Bro. It wasn't the only one. So I, I found the article 92 weeks in Boston, 112 weeks in Montreal, uh, two years in Montreal Paris, makes sense. Yeah. And then 114 consecutive weeks in a single theater in Minneapolis. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Owning it, I love it. Owning it. Boston, I don't know. Did Boston used to be nicer? Uh, well, Boston's got a ton of colleges. <laughs> has like the most colleges. Oh per right, capita yeah, yeah. The city. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So wild. film nerds and yeah, stuff. MIT kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can't see like I don't know uh, Celtics fans or the no, Red Sox. Not fans. Not people are not watching <laughs> yeah. that movie. Let's go, Harold and Maude. The Affleck brothers, though maybe I don't know. Any final closing thoughts here on these movies? I I, I think we kind of closed it out, but I will say that like, yeah, Badlands to me, obviously uh, it only gets better with age. The the whole flatness and how he plays with how he kind of comments on fame to me just gets more. And it's something that I've sort of lived by for most of my life. I stopped using social media personally about 10 years ago. I don't use it. I don't like it. I hate the concept of creating an image uh, of yourself online and that kind of stuff. So for me, it obviously rings very, very true. Uh, Who's going to share these film trace posts? Well, yeah, that's, <laughs> oh, that's, <different. laughs> that's I mean, on you, Gary. <laughs> oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? It's like you know, creating your sense of self online through Facebook and all that sort of stuff. It's like it's always felt um, unmoored to me. And I think you know, looking at a film like Badlands, it's like, oh yeah, like there's always been people like me who are just sort of curmudgeons and don't really believe, don't really believe in the latest technology or anything like that. Um, and then the Harold and Maude speaks for itself in terms of its um, importance 
I mean, it's just, I have several problems with the film. Uh, some that I've noted, but I think it, ultimately it, um, it's something that speaks to so many different people in so many different ways that you can't, you can't deny that part of it. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Any closing thoughts about these movies? You just had like the speed racer moment for me. Like you you just had that with Harold and where you're like, Oh God, I can't, I feel like a jackass. If I just say, I hate it. It It ends with him playing the banjo on a pastoral (laughs) hill. So (laughs) there you go. Um, I want to let our guests have the last word. So I'm going to keep my comment brief. I just can't express enough uh, how like these two movies have so little in common yet so much in common in terms of like tone versus theme. And yet both of them like made me more excited to talk about movies in a positive way than like I had mentioned earlier any other pair of films on the podcast in recent months. So like it's a testament, I think in both films of the power of seventies American cinema to be able to have such a diverging yet like robust and really nourishing uh, film that plays to completely different audiences. And yet somehow I'm the overlap. (laughs) <laughs> i love it gary what do you think any, any final thoughts for us uh you know, i'm just uh, happy to be here glad i got to see these movies I had an excuse to watch them because i honestly i don't know when i would have ever watched them it's uh you know it's Hell just yeah. neither movie is the one that would like have i don't know when you're just trying to scroll through and pick things i don't know yeah they don't really come up probably it's like right yeah. right and so it was a good excuse to watch them and i'm glad i've seen them um so i think they're both worth a watch And, uh, I don't know. I think your conversation about Badlands made me want to watch that one again a little more. Like, I'm like, Oh, I kind of want to go back and and look at that a little bit more just because as we're, we were talking it out, I was like, Oh, there's a lot of stuff. I was not thinking of just trying to take it in for the first time. And, uh, but, but I mean, that said, Harold and Maude, I I could see it, it inspired a lot. It's, it is what people think of when they think of, indie cinema or something Absolutely. like it just yeah. it just feels like it so even though it's, it's from cool. a major cool studio though that's the crazy part right. yeah that's a good point <laughs> so what's coming up on cinema uh, cinema shock with you guys what do you got going on uh we're doing a series right now on sam raimi so we're talking about him and bruce campbell and their adventures so uh evil dead's out uh i'm not sure when this will drop but we're doing uh crime wave right after this and evil dead Two, and army of darkness we're not going through like everything like we did with james cameron but uh we're gonna hit his major like i think actually this time we're even skipping the spider-man movies we're, we're kind of skipping his big hollywood time sure and then when he jumps back into like drag me to hell uh right after that so we'll we'll kind of get him to hollywood and talk about okay he did hollywood and then back but anyway so we'll be exploring the life and times of Sam Raimi. Awesome. That's fantastic. Definitely check it out. Uh, Cinema Shock. Uh, thanks for being here, Gary. Um, yes, thank you. Chris, what do we got coming up next? We're, this is that we did uh, Lolita in the 60s. We did Badland 70s. What, in the 80s, what do we got doing? What's going on? Oh, man, it's it's your pick. It's probably our most uh, trad, unrisque film of the risque romance genre, but still arguably very risque for um, both its time period and cultural relevancy. Um, it's Terminator 2. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's close. But Valley Girl. Valley Girl. Um, <laughs> with a little chaser of My Beautiful Laundrette, the Daniel Day-Lewis movie from 85. So I'm excited. We'll, we're going to have our friend Bridget back on the air, uh, get um, uh, her perspective. And I will be fascinated to hear everybody's interpretation of Nicolas Cage's performance in that one. Awesome. Sounds great. Thanks for listening. This has been Film Trace. 